Greetings to you this morning on this last day of 2023. I don't know if you've seen the notice that today it's one, two, three, one, two, three. It's like learning a wall step. Okay, so today it turns out to be one, two for December, three, one for today, then two, three for uh, the year itself. Today is the first Sunday of this after the season Sunday of Christ and it is New Year's Eve it only happens once every seven or eight years that Christmas uh, New Year's Eve falls on on a Sunday as did Christmas Eve last week First Church of Christ is an open and affirming UCC church which means you are welcome here no matter where you are from who you love or where you are at your, on your spiritual journeys. We welcome you here in person or online. We are also an intergenerational church and place a high priority on children's and youth ministries. Psalm 100 verses one and two says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. Please stand for the call to worship. On this bright morning full of love, the gift of a child, the gift of comfort, the gift of presence, and the gift of joy. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we praise you for the brightness and hope of this new day and the beginning of a new year. May the hours ahead be filled with moments in which we see and know your love and care. And may we fill the future hours with our dedication and giving of our energies to seek and to do your will. Oh God, we know that you are with us at all times, even when we do not feel or trust your presence. Make us thankful that our days are known to you, that faith lasts longer than the night, that your judgment is always redemptive and your mercies are sure. Help each of us to rest in the joy of what you are and to work in the happy confidence 
that the love we know in Jesus Christ will rule the world someday. We bless your holy name without ceasing. Let us turn to one another and share the peace of Christ. Shalom. Salam alaikum. <laughs> peace. Peace to you. That's great. <laughs> like high five. Shalom. sing the song of sharing the joy of the birth of Jesus. Go tell it on the mountain. Scripture this morning comes from Luke 9, verses 57 through 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. 
But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here ends our reading. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Michelle. As a message for children of all the ages, I don't know if the tradition sometimes is that the children come forward, but uh, so if the children come forward, but you're all children of God, so you're all listening as well. Do you usually sit right? I don't want to break your tradition. You can sit down there, sit over here. Or right on the floor, that's good. That's what, Yeah, that's where uh, some of you got the carpet, some of you got the hardwood, but that's okay. Very good. Good morning. Good to see you. Happy New Year's Eve day. Okay. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about not making resolutions, but thinking about what might be the idea. I don't know if any of you make resolutions for New Year's, for the whole New Year. Some people do, most people do it and then they break it within the first month or so. What's that? Okay, yeah, resolution is a resolve, saying on this day and for this year, I'm gonna do this or I'm not gonna do that. What's that? No, you don't buy, buy anything. It's what you're deciding you want to do that's new. So I'm going to ask you today not to make a resolution, but to think about if you were to make a resolution, think about just doing something tomorrow and not think about the whole year. Just think about one day at a time. Think of that. And so I'm, I would like, like to ask you what one new thing might you want to do this new year, but starting with tomorrow? Or what is one new thing you want to stop doing? So it can be either starting something or stopping something. So just when, when you've got an answer of what you'd like to do or not do, just speak it out. Okay, what's yours? Don't steal. No, you have to stop stealing. Don't steal. That's a very good one. Right. Yeah. To eat less sweets. Except I'm probably going to fail that. Okay. Yeah. To eat less wheat? Sweets. Wheaty. Candy. Candy. Sweets. Sweets. Okay, I was hearing wheat. Yeah, that's a good one to stop candy. Yeah. Let me tell you a short story. I, I have served churches in different places, and Halloween, Halloween, well, I was telling my children's message one Sunday there, uh, right at Halloween, and I said, what I recommend to you, instead of eating all that candy that you just got, stick all the candy in the freezer, and each day, take out one piece of candy, and eat the candy. And so that was one way of not making a resolution, but thinking, I'm going to save that candy. And then I'd ask each Sunday, how many of you still have some candy left? And some, no, I ate it all. I ate it all. <laughs> Others said, yeah, that's helpful. And uh, by, by sticking in the freezer, it makes you not, you not, you have to work harder to get to it. But that's, that's a way of thinking about sweets. Okay, so. <laughs> you would, what? You have some from Halloween. That's congratulations there. Yeah. Now, was that candy you didn't like? No. No? Some of it I like, like the cheese and Okay, yeah. So you have a little bit on special occasions, like maybe on Christmas, New Year's Eve. And we use a lot of it for uh, gingerbread houses. Ah, you make gingerbread houses. Okay. How, how many of you made a gingerbread house this year? One, two, one, two, two. 
Okay. Have some of you come into the Springfield Museum to the gingerbread house exit? You wanted to. Yes. Okay. I went there a couple of weeks ago. It ends today. So. Uh, yeah, the doctors. That's another museum. So that's a whole other story we can do. Yeah. Ah, okay. That's the tough thing with a gingerbread house. Yeah. And then I smashed it. The whole house with the candy off. Yeah, I grabbed it and threw it off my balcony. Oh, you did? <laughs> that was pretty. And then, I, and then I put my dog on it. <laughs> I thought it was like, yeah. yeah, some like to smash it and eat it. Yeah, but gingerbread houses are nice to make, and particularly they're made to eat. Too. And, tasty. and tasty too <laughs> candy or just the gingerbread so let me continue to see if any of you have thought of something that you would like to do or not do this year yep maybe go to like the air museum to see if they have B-17 sky fortress say that again maybe go to the air museum to see if they have a B-17 sky fortress from World War II. Oh, good. Yes. That's something yeah. you want. Well, still, you can resolve that you want to do that. You may only go once, but still, that's going to the museum to see the, the old airplanes is good. Yeah. They're, well, Springfield Museum has some. They have some what they call BG planes, they were, or GB planes that were made in Springfield. But then there's an aircraft museum down the river uh, with a lot of airplanes. Are you old enough to fly yet with a plane? Without a plane? Okay. So back here, yes. You want to see who more? Listen to my parents more. Listen to your parents more? Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Listening. Yes. Get better at math. Get better at math. Now, how do you do that? Practice. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Just like I did square roots and stuff. Yeah. Well, that's good. Math is a very important subject, even if sometimes you think, what's the connection with life? But yeah, yeah. you're rocking a boat here. Yeah. Say you want to buy something, math. Math is very, you, arithmetic is very helpful. Right, math. Yeah. Okay. Did you, did you have something, do you have something you want to do or? You don't want to say it right now. Okay. Is this something she wants to do or not? You forgot it. Well, that's, that is tough. Maybe working on remembering things. Yeah. I have something for tomorrow, but uh, I shouldn't say it. Oh, is it a secret? You can tell me. I won't tell anybody else. <laughs> Some people, so it's still a secret. Yeah. Somebody told me once something and said, don't tell anybody else. And, well, I, and I didn't. I'm not but, telling anyone. I that's good. Yes. Be grateful what you get. Be grateful what you for what, with what you got. Yeah. Be thankful for what you've got. Be grateful for what you've got. That's good. Oh, those are very good. Thank you. So you can always come up with new things you want to start doing or stop doing. You don't have to wait until New Year's Eve or New Year's Day to do that. But always think about doing things in one step at a time, like the one, two, three, one, two, three, step at a time. Okay, thank you very much. You are now given permission to go back to your seats. Don't forget to go to school this week. When I first thought about talking with the children, I was thinking about asking, what did they do for Christmas? 
But then I thought, no, I'm going to preach about the subject, don't look back, and that Christmas is looking back. So asking them what they'd like to do or not do in the future is helping them don't look back. And I have a suspicion, every church I've been in, I know very often the adult will come out and remember the children's message, but don't remember the rest of the service. <laughs> uh, so, and that happens too. I mean, some of the pastors don't even remember what they preached about. So, uh, but uh, the children's message is always heard, because uh, I know you're listening, whether you're online or whether you're here in person. Now, some of you may remember the old wooden roll top desks. Uh, my grandfather had one, I remember. He had one in his office at home. Uh, and that the big roll top desk had this surface that had all these little cubicles that had different sizes and shapes, little closets on the roll top desk. When the roll top is down, you can't see what's in the desk. You roll up the wood. Uh, cover, and then you see all this chaos, uh, uh, hidden things that are there, pigeon, literally called pigeonholes, uh, cubicles, drawers. Some of the compartments are open so that you can see what's stuffed into them. Others were closed and kept private records or private materials. So much information could be stored in that roll top desk. It's amazing keeping them organized yet looking like chaos. These days, my and perhaps your computer desk is somewhat like that. Much more able to store a lot more, obviously, with all the files and folders that we can store on the computer, but especially all the stuff we can store in the cloud all the information we can access with our computer all over the world. Today, things are happening around the world. Good news, bad news. We're able to have so much information. I still have a lot of paper and desk supplies on my computer desk. I keep a section, I've got a desk that does have a sort of bookshelf above the PC. And so the books that I need weekly are on one shelf. Another shelf holds that essential reams of paper. You remember when they said, with the computer, you won't need any more paper? Well, that's not true. <laughs> you might usually need some things just to save them in a hard copy. All of the office supplies are on other surfaces or in the drawers of my desk. Uh, so we still have our own systems, and every one of you I know must have your own system uh, to store information or to be able to access it easily. And the computers are a remarkable invention. So that you, each of you, have the way that you can get certain things at certain times. And, and I'm, I always have some friends who have stacks of things and they can tell me, I know where it is, it's on that pile underneath there, about three quarters down on the pile. They, they know where it is, even though it looks like I wouldn't know where it is. I recall a friend who was a knitter uh, and she kept several different boxes of different kinds of yarn and strings and ribbon, ribbons. And she even had one box labeled string too short to save. <laughs> now, sometimes she might have found some reason to have saved it, but we can do that. It's a part of being a human being that we want to hold on to a lot of things from the past and that we may not want to think about, but we may need them in the present today or into the future. It's very important to recall the past, to keep our memories alive and green. It's one of the unique abilities that separate us as humans from most animals. We used to think other animals didn't have memories, but we're learning more and more particularly elephants and whales, for example, but many animals, and, and perhaps dogs and cats, uh, have memories, even though they can't often verbalize in our language what they are remembering. So memories of the past give us security, a relationship to that which is meaningful and valuable in our lives. Some people like to remember the positive and the happy memories. And there are others who like to dwell 
on the tragedies and the unhappy memories. And most of us try to keep a balance between the happy memories and the sad or bad memories. So the value of the roll-top desk or the computer or other storage systems is that we can keep our memories and those associated with them, and we can bring them out when we want to or need them. Sometimes the past becomes a burden on us that prevents us literally as an obstacle from living in the present or moving into the future. Now I say that also in the context that I cherish history, the past. Some of my favorite interests include archeology, span anthropology, and history, and cosmology. But I learned to live in the present shaped by what I have learned and continue to learn about the past. Much of my theological education, for example, has been in the history of the Bible. It's hard for us to be a Christian without knowing about the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Apocrypha. Or I studied a lot about the history of the church, and that also comes in, hand, uh, in hands, handy use. So the past is fascinating, and it's valuable for us to understand the present. As one gets older, as we all do every day, and particularly as our family members or our friends die, we miss their presence, and our memories can keep us connected to them. But it sometimes happens that someone loses family and friends by death or loss, neglect to take the steps to make new friends and develop new relationships. My mother had a habit as she was in her later years, when a friend died, when one friend died, she'd make an effort to make two new friends to replace them. And if we also know we can continue to make new friends, even with the loss of the old friends. Or the memory of those who are loved ones to us is important because that's a basic part of our entire life. Our relationship to the church is similar to this. There are many traditions and events and memories that are associated with this local church or with any other church that you've been a part of in your own lifetime. It's important to maintain and cherish the past life of the church, but there's also the need to keep alive and aware of the needs of the present time. As you well know, well know, change and new events and experiences are parts of growing and being able to serve the needs of the congregation as well as the community. So we want to try to keep a balance between the past and the future, preserving and respecting the past of our church's life and the wider church's life and history while also moving in to the future. One analogy I often think about is when we're driving our car or whatever motor vehicle we use, we're, we're using the front windshield, which is about 40 times more than the rear view mirrors. And there's a reason for that. We need to see through the rear view mirrors what's going on behind us, but those are small compared to looking through the entire windshield because that's where we need to see where we are going as well as defensively being aware of who's coming up behind us. We cannot build the kingdom of God on our own upon the traditions of the past. We cannot pigeonhole our actions and our ideas and believe that they're going to be useful and valid for all time. The church exists to keep alive not only the memories of the past, but the church exists to put those religious values which it has cherished into new and living ways in the present to continue to thrive into the future. A professor of economics in Lyon University in France once said, it's not the function of the Christian church to create a new civilization. It is the church's function to create the creators of a new civilization. 
and our work with our families, our ministries with our families, our education, our faith formation, uh, for everyone in this congregation is all part of preparing for a new civilization by creating new creators in this congregation. Let us look at the example and the conversation of Jesus in our New Testament reading one more time. Think again about these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. As they, the disciples, were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, Jesus said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now these are among the most difficult sayings of Jesus because it sounds like Jesus is saying, don't think about your loved ones, the person who's died, your family, come, follow me. But they're, and they're not comfortable, they're not easy words even for us as disciples in these days. But Jesus' central message was about the coming of the kingdom of God, the coming of the reign of God, the coming of the community of faith and of believers. His words and life live on because he stood apart from many of the old traditional ways of the Hebrew scripture, interpreting the word of God. Now this conversation takes place between Jesus and three of the disciples who were considering being his followers. And each one is discouraged by Jesus' words to his specific situ situation. None of them appear to be ready to follow completely in Jesus' steps towards the kingdom of God. Now the obstacles to discipleship for those people 2,000 years ago, for us in this century, were to be concerned with our own self or security, or too narrow a sense of our group or our community. And these are still obstacles to us today in, the, in following Jesus as our Lord. They're part of our human nature, part of our history. If we are like the potential disciples and share the same obstacles, then we would not be fit for the kingdom of God. However, God is compassionate. God is forgiving and merciful. And by God's grace enables us to be fit and to be ready to serve and follow God's way. This conversation that the disciples had with Jesus has one purpose, to set forth the supreme importance of the coming and existing community of faith, the loyalty needed to serve God's purpose. This is not a reason to avoid striving or for despair or for giving up, but it is a reason for our challenges and our opportunities. Now the example that Jesus used, not looking back while pulling the plow, may need some explanation. Have any of you ever pulled a plow, held on to a plow and been following a, a donkey or a horse or a tractor? Okay, good example. Uh, in Jesus' day, most of the plowing was done by one person using one plow being pulled by an animal. And so if he's walking along, and the farmers at that time, uh, to our knowledge, were mostly men, if he, he had to push the plow into the ground, and then he would be following straight ahead with the plow if he looked back, 
his shoulders are going to turn back, not just his looking back. He's got to turn all the way back here to see behind him, is he making any progress? And in that process, he's also pulled the plow over. And when he turns around, he's now going on a zigzag away from the straight, straight and narrow way of following that. So this is what Jesus was referring to. Don't look back or you will not be fit for the kingdom of God. Only if he kept looking straight ahead at a sight marker that he would have in his, his view there and keep the animal moving straight would the furrow plowed be straight. This is a reason for us to look forward and upward. It's a way to show us not to believe only in the past, but to live by hope. It is the hope that God can and does work in and through us. Having taken the steps to be in relationship and covenant with God, each of us cannot look back and long for the conditions before we even knew about God's mercy and love. The Apostle Paul declared, you have begun to grow. Who can hinder you in your growth of God as revealed by Jesus is your true purpose. So the challenge is put to us as Christians today is very similar to that given to his earlier followers. We can never be satisfied to rest on the past and what we have had or what we have done. We need always to be alert and aware and responsive to the call and challenges of God and the world as we, as a person and as a people and as a church, move into the future. And as we move together into the future, may God bless each of you as you grow in discipleship. Amen.
is a time for you to share your joys and concerns. Here do you first your joys and then concerns, or you bounce back and forth? Okay, so if you're a joy or a concern, just raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. As many of you perhaps already know, my dear friend Rick Goldie uh, died on Christmas Day this year. Um, Rick and Sue Goldie were longtime residents of Longmeadow and members of church, First Church for many years. Um, they are retired and living in Naples, Florida. Rick had been having quite a few health problems recently, but uh, fortunately, Sue and I were able to have Thanksgiving dinner with them, which was wonderful for uh, what turned out to be a last time to see him. But I ask that your prayers be with Rick and with Sue. Any other hand up? Okay, I know they're, okay, very good. Of a joy. Um, my husband and I have a dear friend who uh, is 83 years old and still lives alone. Um, and uh, she had a medical emergency last week while she was at church that required her to be hospitalized. Uh, they told the family that they found that she had a situation where they did not expect her to survive the surgery. And if she did, she was likely to be uh, needing at least three more surgeries. So um, they were pretty much told just to say their final thoughts with her. She had the surgery last Sunday. She's home. <laughs> and that's just a reminder to all of us that you never know. Um, we have some prayer requests from online. Okay. Um, Mike okay. says, please give us strength and wisdom to understand the best of our past. And Betty Lee says, um, prayers for Carrie, who is back in the hospital. Uh, prayers for Wendy. Uh, who went to the doctor for a routine checkup and they found a mass in her kidneys and she had a kidney removed uh, last week and she, I think she's still in the hospital, so prayers for Wendy. Um, a joy to the new year. We got through 2023, and I hope 2024 is a lot more peaceful. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, prayers for everyone, because it's really sad that um, bad things are happening in the world, because I really want it to be a better year than last year. I have a joy. Oh. How many of you are Swifties? <laughs> Just raise your hand. How many of you are Swifties? Some of you don't say, what's he talking about? Okay. <laughs> Swifties are those who follow Taylor Swift. My joy, and I'm a Swifty, my, my joy is that she received the Person of the Year Award from Time Magazine. The other contenders were all... And, the Time Magazine gives person of the year award whether it's for good or bad and most of the other contenders who were the top nine were doing things that were evil in the world. Taylor Swift, uh, not only in this last year but over her career, is one of the uh, best songwriters. She's song, she writes her own lyrics and her own music. She is a songwriter. She has done a concert series. When, when her concert series was filmed, the last one in the North America tour, I went to Riverdale Theaters to be there that first night when I could see the concert of her last tour, not her concert, but the film of the concert. 
Um, but it's because she's such a positive person. And I encourage you to learn about the life and the music of Taylor Swift uh, and realize that it's not only for her music, but for a lot of other things she's involved in. So my joy is that Taylor Swift became person of the year, but also that Taylor Swift is known around the world uh, for doing good things. Thank you. We got one more prayer request okay. online from Connie. Um, prayers for Pastor Marissa's husband, Peter. Okay. Yes. Actually, I would just like to give thanks for our incredible choir and music director. The music is just so wonderful. And today's anthem was wonderful. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not really great with words. I just use the same adjectives. But <laughs> Good. Okay, let us pray in silence for all of those joys and concerns that were brought before us, uh, both online and in person. Let us pray. O oh God, accept our prayers. You who are the creator, God of all spirit and all matter, we praise you for every experience and person that has led us closer to you. We especially praise you for Jesus Christ, who has been the way, the truth, and the life. Enable us to set our vision upon him as the leader and guide of all faithful souls throughout the entire journey of our lives. Give us the wisdom to walk as he walked, and by keeping close to you, may we have the strength to overcome the world. May nothing withhold us from doing your will and finishing your work, in spite of our excuses of fear or laziness, pride or prejudice, coldness of faith and love. We lift our voices in praise of you who has given each of us special talents of creativity and beauty. Especially we are grateful for the medal of these <clears throat> and harmonies of music shared with all the world through hymns and anthems and compositions. May the music of our hearts and our voices and instruments inspire us to enjoy all the created order. May we strive to be forces for harmony in the midst of the chaos and cacophony of the world. May we rise into nearer communion with you by a patient, loving, and trustful spirit. May we fill every waking hours with faithful duty and well-ordered love. Strip us of every proud thought, fill us with tenderness towards others, and make us ready to help and quick to forgive. You are our rock and salvation to whom we pray and in whom we find our rest and strength. We offer now the prayer that Jesus taught us and we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. <clears throat> <clears throat>
The announcements this morning are that we will have coffee hour after worship downstairs in Bailey Hall. We will resume a regular level of our activity on January 7th, which will be a communion Sunday with a confirmation class right after the worship service. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. This does not mean it is bad to receive. It simply means that it is better to give. What this means is that everything belongs to God, even us, and what we offer in church and to others allows us to acknowledge this.
Almighty God, take these gifts and our gift of our life to you as we serve in this place and wherever we go in the year to come. Amen. There's a backstory for the final hymn that you'll find in the insert in your bulletin. Alfred Lord Tennyson, who was the poet laureate of England for over 50 years, grieved the death of his closest friend at Cambridge, Arthur Hallam. Several years later, Tennyson published a long poem, which many of you may know, In Memoriam, as a tribute to his friend. This poem included these words, which are a carol for the new year, fitting today as much as it was then in 1851. Let us sing together Carol for the New Year by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And now may you go forth from this place of worship into the world that is ruled by our God, and may each one of you be blessed every day of your lives. Amen. <laughs>